This is Len Bobo's last Sunday with us, so he, he wanted to make sure he used every note on that organ before he left, I believe. Uh, Len will go and be the choir master and organist for the uh, Episcopal Church in Columbus, so we, we wish him well on that. They are getting a, a, one of the most versatile musicians I know, getting a wonderful choir master, and they're getting the worst puns this side of Jimmy McPherson. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> we'll keep, we still have Jimmy for bad puns around here, but uh, Len, we will miss you, and of course we'll see you around places, but we we're, we're, wish you luck, and, and God bless the folks that, in Columbus that they will enjoy having you as the choir master. Fortunately, we do have a few people here who can still play the organ, so do not worry. We, we have a, we have a, we've heard that Peter can play the organ before. We, he's going to have to practice a little bit, he says, but uh, he has done this before, and we are going to be looking for a new organist, but just appreciate Lynn. We had cake and a, a nice farewell in the gathering place, but I uh, do wish him all the best. Glad that you all are here today. A lot going on in the life of the church. Uh, the youth have asked me to remind you that their fall festival is a few weeks away, and that, of course, is for the children, but the youth sponsor much, much of it. We'll have our Trunk or Treat outreach event for children and families of Starkville. And uh, if you're, you are some group or a class would like to put together a vehicle and do the trunk retreat, or if you'd like to just donate candy or, or toys for gifts, you know, tiny gifts for the uh, trick or treat, trunk or treat, you can bring them to the church office and we'll be glad to have your assistance. We are, do have a new church administrator coming this week. Uh, Leonard Smith has worked as a church administrator before. He's worked in some other businesses related to church work. And uh, he's a very, very talented person. Very, very nice person, very person, person you'll enjoy getting to know. And he will start with us officially on the 13th and look forward to your help and patience during that transition. Uh, my Bible study on Tuesday has been canceled. My Tuesday 11 Bible study has been canceled. The bishop has called, called me to a meeting. Fortunately, he didn't call just me to a meeting, so I don't worry, I'm not worried anymore. Uh, <laughs> but he's called several pastors to a meeting, and I'm sure he'll tell us what he wants to tell us when we get there. But I will have to miss my Tuesday Bible study, so that has to be canceled this week. Uh, just a lot else going on in the life of the church, so please take note of the other events. We had a beautiful baptism this morning. They're having a baptism at the Connection this morning. So just a great day to welcome new members of our church family. But we are glad that you're here, glad to have all of our visitors here from out of town. Hope that all of you will sign the attendance pass so we might have a record of you being here with us today. I invite you to take your bulletin now and stand as we turn to our call to worship. Make a joyful noise to God, all the earth. Sing the glory of His name. Give to Him glorious praise. All the earth worships you. They will sing praises to you. Sing praises to your name. Most gracious Heavenly Father, we come to hear your word. We come to be together with your people. But we come to praise this day. Hear our prayers. Hear our songs. Hear our worship. For we are here in the name of Jesus the Christ. Amen. You'll find the hymn of praise at number 66 in your hymnal. We'll sing together, Praise My Soul, the King of Heaven, number 66.
Now let us firm our faith this morning by way of the Apostles' Creed. It's found in our hymnal on page 881. Let us say it together. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered from Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day He arose from the dead. He ascended to heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From this you shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.
go to the Lord together in prayer. Well, Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning wishing to encounter your presence in a new and fresh way. We come to give you praise. We come to give you all glory and honor. God, with our voices, God, with our music, God, with our hearts and minds as we give our attention to you. And Lord God, we just know that you are worthy. For we know that you are the God of love, full of goodness and mercy, giving us grace. God, we know that you demonstrate your love to us. God, you continue to pour your love over us each and every day. God, and that you've shown your great love for us through Jesus Christ and your sacrifice to make us new. And so together this morning, God, we draw our hearts to You. Lord God, needing to confess as a church, as a people, the ways in which we have fallen, the ways in which we've sinned, the ways in which we have thought only of ourselves and not of our neighbors, the ways in which we haven't loved You with our whole heart. And so Lord God, we pause to confess to you together. Well, Lord God, we thank you for your grace and for your mercy, for your forgiveness, for lifting us up, for being a God that God, that picks us up, that forgives us, that makes us new. And God, that you're not done with us yet. You're continually shaping and forming us, molding us into your likeness as we come to you. And so for that, we give you thanks this morning. And we give you thanks for so many things. God, for there are small ways in which you have provided for us. God, you are our provider. And you've been the one who has encouraged us, the one who has loved us through friends and through family, through even a stranger this week. You've given us strength and courage. You've been our help. You've given us food and shelter. Lord, there is so much to give you thanks for. And the things that we have upon our hearts and minds, we pause and we lift up to you. Lord God, as you have called us to, to be a church, to give thanks and glory to you this morning, we know that you have also called us to lift up the needs of others, to be your hands and feet in our world, to love and care for those in need. And so this morning as we, as we come together, we wish to lift up those who are hurting. God, those who are sad. God, those who need your help. To bind up the brokenhearted. To heal those who are sick. And Lord God, among us there are folks that have lost loved ones. The Ruffs and the Smiths. And so God, we want to lift them up and as well as any others within our family and our community, our congregation who, who have lost people that they care about. And God, there's folks among us who need your healing touch, who need your help, your restoration to, to be made whole. And Lord God, there are people in places around our country, in Florida and the Carolinas, God, who have lost their homes, lost family, God, who are still in danger from the Hurricane Matthew. God, and even in Haiti, Hundreds have lost their lives. So this morning we pause 
Lord God, and we lift up those who are in need, the ones that you've placed upon our hearts, near and far. Lord God, we proclaim your goodness, not only here in this place of worship, but with our lives as we walk out these doors. Would you lead us? Would you empower us with your Holy Spirit to love you, to be your people, to demonstrate your goodness, your love and your sacrifice, who you are? Lord God, would you lead us together to pray the prayer that our Lord Jesus taught us to pray, saying, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not in temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Now I'd like any children to come forward for children's time. We're a little crowded today. That's all right. Glad that you are here today. Good to see you. There you come. Oh, I've been waiting for you. Glad that you're here. We are kind of crowded because there's so much going on today. But that's because people can do all sorts of things in church. Some people can sing, and some people can play the bells, and some people can play the piano, and some people can dance. You can do anything just about to praise God and to say, God, this is how much I love you. God wants you to use your talents to do it. Now, some of y'all were singing a couple of weeks ago. I saw you, you were singing, weren't you? I saw you sing up here. I saw you try to sing up here. Uh, you sang, yes, you did. You were up here singing. But there's all sorts of things you can do. Does anyone like to dance? Nah, y'all, yeah, we got some, I thought we had some dancers here. Yes, we do. You can use it. Caitlin did a really good job of dancing to say, God, I love you. That was just what she was trying to say and help us to do it. But who knows what you're going to do. But whether you sing or whether you dance or whether you play an instrument in church, there's one thing that everybody can do in church, and that is love each other. We had a little baby here at first service, and we baptized that baby. And the whole congregation, everybody here. Huh? We did for Asher that another time we sure did. That was so sweet. You were there. And we had everyone promise to love that little baby and help that little baby grow. And some people have been doing that for you. People have been helping you grow. But even you, you've got a little brother, don't you? Do you love your little brother? All right. You have, a, you have little ones. You're the, you're the big sister. You are. I can pick up both of them. You can pick up both of them. You're the strong big sister. We all can love our brothers and our sisters, but not just our brothers and sisters, but everyone in this church, because that's what churches do. Some people sing, and some people dance, and some people play the bells, but everybody looks after each other and loves each other and helps each other. And that's the neat thing about being a church. Let's pray together. Most gracious God, we thank you that we are in part of this church, and we are part of this family. And we thank you for everyone who sings, we thank you for everyone who dances, we thank you for everyone who plays and prays, but we thank you that we can love each other. Help us to do that. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Our offertory hymn is The Gift of Love, and you'll find it at number 408, number 408 in the hymn book. The Gift of Love. Let's stand and sing together.
gracious God, we come in worship. We come in praise. We come in thanksgiving. We bring these gifts. Please accept them for your church and for your kingdom. We bring them in the name of Jesus the Christ. Amen. You may be seated.
proceed. We're still in Luke's Gospel. We're in the 16th chapter, picking up with the 19th verse. There was a rich man who dressed in purple and fine linen and lived in luxury every day. At his gate there lay a beggar named Lazarus, covered with sores and longing to eat what fell from the rich man's table. Even the dogs came and licked his sores. The time came when the beggar died, and, was carry, and the angels carried him to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried in Hades, where he was in torment. He looked up and saw Abraham far away with Lazarus by his side. So he called up to him, Father Abraham, have pity on me and send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, because I am in agony in this fire. But Abraham replied, Son, remember that in your lifetime you received good things, while Lazarus received bad things. But now he is comforted here, and you are in agony. Besides all this, between us and you is a great divide that has been set in place, so that those who want to go from here to you cannot, nor can anyone cross over from there to us. Then he answered, Then I beg you, Father, send Lazarus to my family, for I have five brothers. Let him warn them so that they will not come to this place of torment. Abraham replied, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them listen to them. No, Father Abraham, but if somebody comes from the dead and goes to them, they will repent. He said to him, If they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, they will not be convinced, even if someone rises from the dead. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God.
Back in my MYF days, over 40 years ago, that's hard to believe, but it's how long ago it was. Our favorite activity in MYF was to take Bible stories and to act them out, especially parables. We, we, would, we would maybe change a little bit of the setting, maybe make it a little more modern, maybe add a little degree of humor, but some of the stories were pretty funny already. But we always thought that we were keeping what we believed to be the essence of the story. What was the Bible story? What was Jesus really trying to say? But we got pretty creative. I remember our version of the house built upon the rock and the house built upon the sand because we had to take it outside because we were throwing water balloons at the time. And uh, then there was our unforgettable version of the uh, prodigal son in which my interpretation of the death of the fatted calf goes down as one of the great moments in method acting. Uh, <laughs> but one of our favorite stories was the one I just read a few minutes ago, the story of the rich man and Lazarus. It is a great story, and it goes, it's pretty long as parables go, so we turned this into an epic. I mean, it was a wonderful story. And that was the one that got us in the most trouble. It wasn't that we were too vulgar or that we got away from the Bible story. Our story as we acted it out was very true to what Jesus was saying in the Bible. It's just that we decided to make it contemporary and we set it in Jackson, being that we were at Christ Church in Jackson. That's where we grew up. And setting it in Jackson, we tried to think of a, of a huge mansion with gates. And the biggest mansion with gates that we could think of was the governor's mansion. And yes, we did make the rich man the then sitting governor of Mississippi. Uh, we didn't mean anything by that. It was just a parable after all. I mean, at that point in our lives, the governor was more like kind of a, a fictional character on TV. I can't even think of who it really was back in the day. But it was not a real person, more like that kind of generic stock character that Jesus often used in parables, and it seemed to fit for us. And it would probably have been all right if we had just done it at MYF, but we did it at Sunday night church. And that was back in the days where you could get a couple of hundred people at Sunday night church. And though we never found out who it was for at least one person in the audience, the governor was not a stock fictional character, but a close personal friend and a political ally. We did not really get in trouble per se, but they did vet our skits a lot more closely after that. <laughs> Looking back, we really did tell the story that Jesus intended to tell. And looking back on it, we probably were wrong to specifically name the person because Jesus usually kind of kept it very generic like that. But at the same time, we realized, you know, parables were not meant to be cute. They were meant to make a point. And sometimes they did use humor, and sometimes they used kind of this once upon a time sense of the story to make it a little more palatable and maybe to soften the edges a little bit. But they're meant to teach us a lesson. And quite often they're meant to challenge us, and often enough they are meant to make us feel uncomfortable. And I think that's what Jesus was trying to do in this parable. There was a rich man who was dressed in purple and fine linen and who feasted sumptuously every day. The rich man is never named in the story. Some people think that his name was Dives, but that just comes from a, a misreading of the Latin translation. Dives is very close to the word for rich in, in Latin. But in any case, he's unnamed but he's well described. He is rich, and as we'll see, being rich was not really his problem, but it went hand in hand with his problem. He was a high official, maybe royalty. The Romans had put strict limits on who was allowed to wear purple. It was, it was a very select group. He lived well, he ate well, he had everything. And on the other hand, Lazarus had a hard life. Interestingly, Lazarus is the only person in all the parables that Jesus gives a proper name to. It gets a little confusing because one of Jesus' best friends is also named Lazarus. It was probably a more common name back then. But this is not the Lazarus whom Jesus raised from the dead. That's someone else altogether. The name Lazarus means God helps, but it doesn't look like God was helping Lazarus very much, at least not at the very beginning of the story. Lazarus is a poor beggar, and it's not lack of ambition or, or lack of, uh, of willingness to work. He's sick. He's ill. He's too weak to work. And he might have been able to survive with some help. He, in fact, he might have been able to survive on what the rich man was just throwing away. But the clear implication in the story was the rich man didn't bother even to share his trash, even his leftovers with Lazarus. And as will be made clear later in the story, the man knows who Lazarus is. 
He has to go past him all the time. He even knows his name. Lazarus is not some nameless and faceless hungry person in a faraway land that we can't even pronounce the name of the country. Lazarus is a person whose face and name and needs were known to the rich man. He can't claim ignorance. He can't claim, oh, I, I, I didn't know what was going on. Lazarus was there every day. As the story goes, both men die. The story doesn't say how or why. The Lazarus almost certainly died of starvation. He died of his illness. Some people have liked to assume that the rich man choked on something, but that's speculation. The Bible doesn't say that. In our MYF play, we had him have a heart attack on the steps of the Capitol. Uh, it was well played, but not as good as my death of the fatted calf. It was... <laughs> but here's where the story gets kind of interesting. In the first century, the Jewish people were kind of split on what happened to you after you died. There were some people among the Jews who believed you died and that was it. The Sadducees, most famously among them, they did not believe in a resurrection. They did not believe in a life after death. They believed you lived. And whatever rewards and punishments you were going to get in this life, and if you had a long life, God was rewarding you. And if you had a short life, God was punishing you. But that was it. And we see several times in the gospel where they had arguments with Jesus around just that sort of point. There were other Jewish people at the time of Jesus who believed in a life after death, complete with a good place and a bad place, a heaven and a hell. But even they were split on whether you went there straight away or whether there was a waiting place. Some called it paradise, where you waited until the final judgment, when all humanity would be judged at the same time, and all humanity would get their assignment then. And that's what some scholars think is happening here, because both the rich man and the poor man can, can see each other. And most scholars think they go to paradise to await the final judgment. But even in paradise, even in the waiting place, some waiting rooms are better than others, and they're kind of indicative of, of, of which way you're headed. Lazarus finds himself in the penthouse suite. He finds himself in the very bosom of Abraham, <coughs> hanging out with the great saint. The bosom of Abraham is a colloquial phrase for the highest bliss. But as the story goes, he's really there. He is really with Abraham, while the rich man finds himself in torment. And again, that's what the story says, but because the Jews of that day had so many different beliefs, we're not quite sure what it's supposed to mean. You know, it may be that this is heaven and this is hell, but you can still see each other. But in any event, the rich man can see Lazarus hanging out in all glory with Father Abraham. And while if he's not in hell, he's in a reasonable facsimile of it. And so the rich man cries out, Father Abraham, have mercy upon me. Send Lazarus to dip his finger in some water and put it on my tongue, for I'm in agony in these flames. While it's right, and probably a good thing that he would ask for mercy at this time, two things jump out at you from this point of the story. One, he does know who Lazarus is. He knows him by name. But two is, he still thinks of Lazarus as someone that he can order around. He thinks of Lazarus as someone who ought to be doing his bidding. He's been taken down a notch, but we get a blimp, glimpse here of his most basic problem. It's not the wealth in and of itself. It's his attitude towards other people. Maybe his wealth is the cause, maybe it is a symptom, maybe it is a result, but his basic attitude is the problem. I'm different. I am better. I matter more. My needs matter more than anyone else. That's where he's coming from, and that's his sin. His hard-hearted contempt for the poor and his own self-indulgent glorifying of his own needs all both point to an inability to see beyond himself. He is selfish in the truest sense of that word. It's all about himself. He hasn't needed, he hasn't cared about anyone else, not even God, and that is what got him in this state. You know, reading the Gospels, a common theme in the Gospels is reversal. The last shall be first. And that's part of what Abraham responds back to him. Child. And that's a very kind word he uses to the man. But he, he says, remember, during your lifetime you received many good things. And Lazarus in, the, 
like manner evil things. But now he is comforted here, and you are in agony. And besides all this, between you and us, there's a great divide that's been fixed so that those who might want to pass from here to you cannot do so, and no one can cross from there to us. That's said very gently. Clarence Jordan, who wrote the Cotton Patch Gospels, he took the Gospels and kind of put them in, in very old American South dialect, interpreted Abraham's answer less politely. Lazarus ain't going to run your errands no more, rich man. But that was part of the message. The rich man has then a moment of compassion, at least compassion for his own family. He doesn't want his brothers to meet the same fate. But even then, he spoils it by thinking that once again he can still order Lazarus around. He tells Lazarus, send, he tells Abraham, send Lazarus to go help my brothers. Abraham's response here is one of my favorite parts of the story. Well, they have Moses and the prophets. They should listen to them. In other words, they could read their Bible. If they read the law of Moses, if they read the word of the prophets, they would know what to do. They would know how to avoid your faith. They have it. It's been written down. They don't need anything else. That should be warning enough for them. But the rich man doesn't think that's very likely. But the ghost of Lazarus, that might get their attention. That might even scare them into repenting. And then Abraham closes out the parable saying, if they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, neither will, be the, neither will, be the, me, neither will they be convinced even if someone rises from the dead. I have to suspect that line was directed towards the Jewish people who would not accept Jesus as the Messiah and who would ultimately not believe in the resurrection. That reminds us that, that you know, no miracle stands on its own. Some, some great miracle, some great mighty act could happen in front of us, but if we don't have the context of God's Word, if we don't have the context of what God is trying to do, then we might just see it as a magic trick. We might just see it as part of the show. We might not understand what the miracle can mean to us. It reminds us no miracle stands by itself, but must be seen in the light of the Word of God. All in all, we love this story, but it really isn't an easy story. There's a lot of stuff, though, in this story. Of course, we should care for our, our neighbors. I mean, that's, that's an important part of the story. But I keep coming back to the rich man, because ultimately, he is the perfect illustration of why, as the Scripture says, a person cannot serve two masters. The fact that he only trusts in himself and the things, the <coughs> possessions he's accumulated comes back to the fact that he is unable to trust in God. He can't see beyond his own self. He can't see beyond his own needs. He can't see his neighbor at his doorstep. Even worse, he can't see God who made all of this and who has blessed him in so many ways. He is unable to see God and therefore he is unable to trust God to give meaning and purpose to his life. He is unable to trust God to give him a right relationship to the world and all that's in it. He's unable to trust God to help him know how he's supposed to live with other people. He's unable to trust God to give him either a word of hope or a word of law. The bottom line is, he is unable to trust God. He can't see. He can't acknowledge. He can't know. He can't love. He can't have a relationship. He cannot trust God. So all of his confidence is in himself. I'm the only one that matters. All the confidence is in his stuff. This is my stuff. This is what makes me who I am. Jesus says elsewhere, what shall it profit a man if he gains the whole world but loses his soul? This parable answers that question. Let us pray. Most gracious Heavenly Father, help us to never lose sight of you. Help us to never lose sight and take for granted the people around us, our neighbors, those who are hurting, those who need us. But in all things, let us begin by never losing sight of you, your word, your commandments, 
your love, your grace, your mercy. Help us to know that we are not alone and we don't have to act like we're alone because you are with us and you give us meaning and you give us hope and you help us understand and you help us see. Help us to not take you for granted. We pray in the name of your Son, the Christ. Amen. We open the doors of this church to anyone who would be part of this church family with us. We'd be glad to receive you. You'll find the hymn at number 436. We'll stand and sing the first and last verses, number 436. wish y'all all all the best as we all go forward. We will will see you around. God bless you. Thank you all for sharing your gifts, your talents, your presence with this service. May you go in peace knowing that the love of God your Father, grace to His Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, and the power and the comfort of the Holy Spirit go with you. Amen. The words of the response are written in your bulletin. We'll sing it through twice. Amen.